Good evening. Great to see you tonight. Thanks for joining us. Tonight as we gather, the epistle reading that we look at is uh, St. Paul writing in Galatians. But actually as he writes, it sounds so familiar to us because he's restating again what he's already written in Ephesians. There is this great phrase that we use that comes out of Ephesians, for we are saved by God's alone, grace alone. And remember, grace is when God gives us what we do not deserve. And that's what we'll talk about tonight as we unpack that. Our order of service tonight is all printed for you in your bulletin. For those of you who are watching from home, you can find that at www.divineshep.org. And it's so great to have you with us tonight as we gather for the service of evening prayer. Please stand if you're able. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The light of darkness can overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening. And the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness. And Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ. We have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, universe proclaims your glory. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful, and you love your whole creation. And we, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you. Let my prayer rise before 
Let us pray. Let the incense of our repentant prayer ascend before you, O Lord, and let your loving kindness descend on us, that with purified minds we may sing your praises with the church on earth, and the whole heavenly host may glorify you forever. Amen. Please be seated. The psalm for this evening, Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? Who is seated on high? Who looks far down on the heavens and on the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. We continue with our hymn.
Hear the word of the Lord this evening from Paul's letter to the church in Galatia, beginning in the third chapter. St. Paul writes this. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ." There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for as you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of this world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of this world, whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid that I may have labored over you in vain. This is the word of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for the hope and the promise that we have that we are forgiven completely by your grace alone. Help us, Father, always to live in that as your dear children. Bless us now in the preaching of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, imagine with me this scenario, and maybe it's not that far off for some of us. Imagine that you have a huge debt. I mean a huge debt, a debt that as you look at it, it takes your breath away debt. You've made some bad decisions. You've invested in things that have turned south. All of that debt is continuing to grow, and as you look at it, you realize that you can't pay this, ever. And then you add on top of that a few years of really terrible health and no insurance. And now your debt is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And it's yours. No one else. It's all yours. The bill collectors are paying. The pressure is on you to pay it. And then you realize that you have no way out. They come to take everything. Everything you have, you are left with absolutely nothing. And then what's worse is you're still left with two-thirds of the debt. And there's no way to get out of it. Pretty discouraging as we look at that. But then one day you go and get the mail and you open up the letter and or you open up the mail and you look at the letter and and suddenly someone writes to you, "Dear, Dear friend, I have seen your burden, I have seen your struggle, I know your debt. And I paid it. All of it. You're free. No more debt. How would you respond? Well, the first response is, yeah, right. It'd be disbelief. Who would do that? Who would pay such a great debt without expecting anything at all from us? No one I know. Not here on earth anyway. And then as you investigate your debt and you start going to your creditors, they say, thank you. Thank you for paying it. You're paid in full. There's nothing here left. And you realize that your entire debt of everything is gone. And you're free. And you don't have to worry about that again. That would be that would be breathtaking. That would be such an amazing thing to think about that. That's grace. 
God giving us what we do not deserve. The debt we incur is sin. The wages that we work for bring death. The wages of sin are death. And we have this mounting debt of sin in our lives apart from Christ. But by His grace, He steps into your world and He gives you faith. And that faith connects you to the cross. That faith connects you to Jesus saying to Telestai, your debt, all of it, all of your sin, no matter what it was, no matter when it started, until the day that you die, all of that sin has been paid for by Christ and his wounds on the cross for you. You are free, saved by grace. God gives us that gift through the cross and he connects us to the cross through the baptism where he gives us faith to believe that this gift is yours. It's a done deal. Your sin is paid for, and you are free, saved by grace alone. And I still just shake my head and think about when I think about grace. How, how could that be? How could God in heaven, a holy and a righteous God that tolerates no sin whatsoever, look at me and say, forgiven? Because of Jesus. It's overwhelming to think about that. But it's a gift to you. Because of God's great love and mercy and grace upon you, He has given you this as a gift. In the epistle reading today, as St. Paul is writing, he reminds us that, that God has, at the right time, given all of these things to us. He's taken this through the Old Testament with the prophets have been preaching about a time when God will bring a Savior into the world, where the law will no longer be your guardian, well, it will not be holded, held over you. The law will be there for you, but it will be fulfilled in Christ. The prophets all pointing ahead to a time when the gift will be yours. John the Baptist steps on the scene, kind of the last Old Testament prophet in the New Testament, and he teaches us, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus is coming. Your salvation is soon at hand. And as John the Baptist prepares us for the events of Christ, St. Paul writes this, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. To redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. When we look at Jesus' life into our world, we see him on the cross giving his life for us. But the only way that would work is if Jesus was sinless his entire life. The sinless son of God. The perfect sacrifice for us, for our sins. And when the time was right, God became flesh and dwelt among us in the womb of Mary. God lived and taught, and ate, and drank, and slept, and cried, and rejoiced, and taught, and pushed back the evil of the world, so that we would see him as Savior. When the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son to pay your debt. One of the things that I've learned over the last number of years, every time we plan an event like something for the youth, The advice I've been given over and over again is, well, you have to charge something, and it has to be something of a substantial value. You can't just plan an event and make it free because nobody will come. They see no value in it if you don't pay. So we put a a price on the event so that people see, well, it'll cost me this much, therefore it must have value. That's the way we think in our world. If, we don't, if it doesn't have a cost, then it must not have any value. St. Paul has a question within the epistle reading for today, and that question is this. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? St. Paul asks us, do you really want to stay saved by grace or do you want to run back and be a part of that debt again? Well, our answer is pretty clear right now, isn't it? If you think of that 
hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt that you have, are you ready to step back into that again? Or do you enjoy being free? It's easy to think, why would anyone do that? Why would they jump back into that? But there are times in all of our lives where we just don't see the grace of God as anything that's valuable. It's just going to church. I'm happy in my life the way it is. Why should I do that? And then as we consider this, the evil one twists the tables on us. And he somehow makes us think that we have to do something to earn the gift. That we have to do something to earn our salvation. You have to make a decision for Christ. This week I had a conversation with a young woman and she was talking about her life and and this is really that story. She said that when she was young she gave her life to Christ and then kind of did her own thing for a lot of years. And then hearing the message of Christ again, she got back to church and she decided to rededicate her life to Christ. And she was baptized again. And my thought was, when does this end? If she continues to try to impress Christ or to do the things that Christ wants her to do, thinking that it's all driven by her own feelings, what happens when she has a bad day or bad days or bad months and Christ seems distant? Now, what's the next step? To be baptized again and again? To give her life to Christ again? To try to feel like God is there with her? Most of the time, this story ends up in one of two ways. It ends up in outright despair that I can't do anything, or it ends up in rejection of Christ. When we take the gift of God and we somehow try to coerce it and make it something that we do, it will never end up being grace. It will always end up being law, something you do to impress God. But listen to St. Paul as he writes in Ephesians. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised up with him to be seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us, In Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Do you hear it? God's grace given to you. No obligation on your part, nothing other than God loving you and saying, here is the debt paid for you because I love you. That's grace. God giving us that, restoring us, and reminding us every day that we are his forgiven children and there is nothing now except his loving mercy given to us. By grace, you have been saved through faith. In Jesus' name. Amen. And now the peace that passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please stand as we continue with the Magnificat.
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For Matthew, Scott, John, and Randy, for all pastors in Christ, for all servants of the church, and for all the people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For Donald and Christy, for all public servants, for the government and those who protect us, that they might be upheld and strengthened in every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in this congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present to await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For Albert, for Colleen, for Ron, for all of those struggling with loss, especially Coral's family, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the faithful who have gone before us and are with Christ, let us give thanks to the Lord. Hallelujah. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord. Let us pray. O God, the strength of all who trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers. And because through the weaknesses of our mortal nature we can do no good thing, grant us your grace to keep your commandments, that we might please you in both will and deed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good evening, dear saints. Great to see you here with us tonight. Thanks for joining us. And again, uh, just keep in mind, the 13th of September, that's Sunday the 13th, we hope to uh, be kind of having a, well, that Sunday is going to be a family reunion, a celebration of all the things we've missed through the summer, and we pray that you'll be able to join us. And then all of our, hopefully, all of our fall activities will start just like they have in the past. Go in his peace.